Good morning. My name, <laughs> my name is Demir Grant, and on behalf of Presbyterian College and the Department of Business Administration and Economics, it is a pleasure to welcome you to the 2014 Robert M. Vance Lecture Series on Business Ethics. The series was created to honor Robert Vance and stresses the importance of honesty, truthfulness, and integrity all traits that Mr. Vance practiced with his work in textiles and banking. Presbyterian College has a reputation of upstanding and honest students. It is the Vance's family desire to continue this legacy as PC prepares us for our future in the business world. We thank the Vance family and the Bailey Foundation for this wonderful opportunity to hear from one of the nation's leading business leaders. To introduce today's speaker, I present to you our president, Dr. Claude Lee. Good morning, everyone. Before I introduce today's lecture, I want to introduce a special guest. And I'm not going to ask him to stand, but if you'd hold your applause until I've introduced all of them, I would appreciate it. Our special guests include Fleming, Fleming Patterson, Amy Thomason, Gail Dixon, Bob Link, our very own PC grad and mayor, Bob McLean, and we're also delighted to have George and Ann Cornelson, and our special guest, Mrs. Virginia Vance, the wife of the late Robert M. Vance. So please join me in recognizing these individuals. Our speaker today has committed herself to improving the lives of South Carolinians. As you can see in her truncated bio in the program, and I emphasize truncated because we couldn't get it all in the program, her biography is fantastic. Mina Shaw has received numerous awards and recognitions and has done a great deal for the state of South Carolina and the South in general. One of her current service not obligations, because that would be the wrong word, but opportunities is chair of the Duke Endowment Board of Trustees. Former South Carolina Chamber of Commerce President and CEO Hunter Howard described Miner as follows. He said she has a sincere passion for not only growing the economy, but for helping others. Greenville Mayor Knox White described her as one of the community's most effective leaders in doing so, he said the following. She understands how successful economic development today depends on a community's attention to everything from education to arts and air travel. She brings an unmatched integrity and a thoroughness to all of her tasks. Gandhi said that there are certain things that can destroy a culture, and he lists nine. I cite only one today, and this one focuses on business. He said, business without morality will destroy a society. It is Minor Shaw's unmatched integrity and moral compass that makes her ideal to be today's lecturer to discuss business with morality. Minor, would you please share your thoughts with us? Thank you, President Lilly. It's an honor to be here today to speak with you as part of the Robert M. Vance Lecture Series. And I'm particularly honored that members of the Vance family are here. What a special, what a special treat. I actually have known the Vance family for a long time, so that makes it even more special. Mr. Vance was an exceptional person who cared deeply about ethics and personal integrity. And this lecture series is such an appropriate way to honor Mr. Vance. As I look out at the audience here today, I can see all different ages represented. And with that, a tremendously varied, a, a varied levels of life's experiences. Many of you might also have very different views of ethics based on your personal experiences. When President Lilly asked me to come speak to you about ethics, I knew that I would have a challenging time writing my talk because ethics is a complicated subject and it's also very personal. 
For me, ethics is a set of moral principles. Your sense of ethics defines who you are, your beliefs, and how you live your life. People view ethics through different lenses. If you took a poll about ethics in this room, there would be many different responses. A few might be, ethics has to do with what my feelings tell me is the right thing to do. Or, being ethical is what the law requires. Or, ethics is like religion, but it's not religion. Everyone defines ethics from his or her perspective. During my career, I have seen the topic of ethics take on a much more important role on the agendas of both for-profit and non-profit organizations. Most companies and non-profit organizations today have extensive conflicts of interest policies and an infrastructure dedicated to compliance and audit, both internal and external audit. The time and the money spent on this can be overwhelming, but it is so important. The stakes are very high if organizations and their employees don't follow ethical procedures. I have observed many changes in ethics and compliance policies since the 2004-05 time frame, and more about that later. Of course, we all know that you start learning about ethics as soon as you can communicate, right after you're born. We were taught values at an early age, honesty, compassion, and respect for others, important foundations for our lives. Despite those values, we have all made mistakes along the way that test our, our value systems and our ethics, and we will continue to make mistakes. Sometimes we face ethical dilemmas when our ethics beliefs do not provide clear resolutions to the problems before us. As we face the new and the challenging world of technology, those situations might become more prevalent, particularly for college students. Our character develops. It is learned as we grow older and as we add to our experiences. We are constantly influenced and sometimes challenged by those around us. John Luther said, good character is not given to us. We have to build it piece by piece by thought, choice, courage, and determination. We build our character and our moral values, our ethics, through our life's experiences, learning and listening. Many times we might not even realize that we're building our character and developing our personal ethics until later in life when we can look back and understand the impact of certain events in our lives. As we mature, our values become synonymous with who we are. We develop a code of values that determines our choices and our actions, which then determine the purpose and the course of our lives. Although I have never thought of Elvis Presley as a philosopher, I think he was very astute when he said, values are like fingerprints. Nobodies are the same. You leave them all over everything you do. Your values become synonymous with who you are. They help define your life and they determine your future. And it is so important to build a good value system early in your life to help deal with the ethical issues that you will face later in life. You also learn so much about yourself when you have to deal with challenging ethical issues. One of my learning experiences was during my senior year of college at UNC Chapel Hill. I was the chairman of the UNC Election Commission. Our commission was responsible for running the campus-wide student body elections, designing the ballots, approving the candidates, managing the ballot boxes, and counting the votes. Everything then was done by hand. I am sure that here at PC, everything is now done electronically and hopefully leaving no room for error. At the time of the election, the UNC student body was around 20,000 people, so our job was equivalent to running the elections in a small town. We had heated elections at UNC with a lot of coverage in our, day, in our campus paper, the Daily Tar Heel. The losing candidate running for one of the big offices in the election that I oversaw accused our commission of stuffing the ballot boxes, or allowing the ballot boxes to be stuffed against him. He protested the election and the commission. Of course, the commission didn't do anything wrong, but he was trying to have a recall 
so he might win the race, or at the very least, make a name for himself as a campus politico. The campus-wide elections at UNC were very similar to the elections that we see in the United States today. Of course, the Election Commission had to protect our reputation to the point of having to defend ourselves in front of the Honor Council at UNC. It was a really trying time, and I remember it very well, to say the least. We won the case, and we protected our reputations as well as the reputation of the UNC election process. I learned quite a lot from that experience. It reinforced my belief that it is critical to stand up for what you believe is right, whether you are standing up for yourself or for someone else. Never compromise your integrity. Edmund Burke said, all that is necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. It is important to be willing to step up, even when it is uncomfortable. You should always defend your reputation, because in the end, it is the only legacy that you leave behind. Ben Franklin made this point well when he said, glass, china, and reputation are easily cracked and never mended well. I've been fortunate to have opportunities to work with a number of nonprofit and for-profit organizations over the last 10 years, I've observed that the changes in audit and compliance committee roles have been remarkable. The audit committees that I sit on now are very different than the audit committee that I sat on when I was a board member of Citizens and Southern National Bank of South Carolina back in the early 90s, which was my first corporate board. Rarely did you hear the word compliance, rather you heard the word audit. However, over the years, due, due to many events, which I'm sure you all have studied about, the word compliance became widely known in all corporations and organizations, both for-profit and non-profit. I had an unplanned and an unwanted opportunity to learn all about compliance right after the mutual fund insider trading and market timing uh, scandals in 2004. At that time, I had just joined the board of Nations Fund, a mutual fund, a mutual fund affiliated with the Bank of America. Unfortunately, Nations Fund is one of the funds implicated in the market timing issues because of the activities of some rogue securities traders. Because of a series of events, all but two of our board members had to resign from the board. I was one of the two who didn't have to resign because I was not a trustee when the alleged market timing occurred. The board members who did have to retire from the board, who were all very fine people, were accused by Elliot Spitzer, the New York Attorney General, who was incidentally running for governor of the state of New York at that time, of being aware of the market timing and allowing it to occur. That was not true, but unfortunately, the minutes of the board meeting, which dealt with a possible market timing issue, didn't reflect that the trustees asked the right questions that would have protected the shareholders and funds. As it turned out, the trustees didn't have an opportunity to ask the right questions because the issue was not fully disclosed. However, the trustees were implicated and had to resign from the board of Nations Fund. They were tainted by the bad behavior of others. They were also victims in a situation that was somewhat out of their control due to the politics in the state of New York. <coughs> I learned from this that you always have to be diligent about your responsibilities. Be informed, be overly prepared, and always ask questions, even if you don't know what kind of question you think you're supposed to ask. If you have a feeling you should ask the question, ask the question. Don't ever be afraid to ask the right questions. If people had asked more questions in 2008, we might have been able to avoid many of the problems that led to the financial crisis that led to the Great Recession. Also, it is tremendously important to listen and to know what you're hearing. Many people hear, but they don't listen or process what they hear. After the market timing and the late trading episodes wrapped the mutual fund industry and after the financial meltdown in 2008, the compliance industry boomed. All banks, securities firms, mutual funds, and insurance companies, among others, have extensive compliance policies. In addition, they all have compliance officers. This is in addition 
to their internal audit teams and their external audit teams. Also, the board members are responsible for overseeing and for reviewing the policies and for also reviewing and understanding the compliance plans. Again, as a board member, it is critically important to understand the compliance plans, to be aware of issues, and to ask extensive questions whenever you think you need to. In addition, every for-profit and non-profit board has or certainly should have ethics policies and conflict of interest statements, which their executive teams and their board members have to sign. It is important for companies to have a strong ethics program with written ethical standards. A good ethics program is there to allow good people to have the tools to do the right thing and succeed. Written policies give employees a framework to make good decisions. Research has shown that organizations with strong ethics programs and strong ethics policies are much more successful. They attract better employees because top quality people want to feel good about their work and the integrity of their organizations. People look for more than just a job. They want to feel proud of their company. It is important to ensure that your employees perform in an environment with integrity and strong ethics. <coughs> an ethical company is only as strong as its weakest employee. Ethics in the workplace is everyone's responsibility. Written policies are critical to help guide employee behavior as are ethics training and available resources. These give employees a framework for making decisions based on the mission, vision, and values of the organization. It is also critical for the leader of the organization to model ethical behavior, to show honesty, respect, and trust. Doing the right thing is a culture that starts at the top. Leaders must define the values of their organization. If ethics are poor at the top, that behavior will likely be copied down through the organization. Roy Disney emphasized the importance of values when he said, it is not hard to make decisions when you know what your values are. Interestingly, when I was recently reading about the 2013 Best Places to Work in South Carolina in the latest issue of the South Carolina Business Journal, which is published by the State Chamber, South Carolina State Chamber, the drivers of employee engagement in South Carolina impress me. Many deal with the ethics of the companies. Some of those drivers that led employee commitment and excellence are the following. Feeling valued in the organization having confidence in the leadership of the organization. The organization treats employees like people, not numbers. Understanding the importance of one's role to the success of the organization. The leaders care about their employees' well-being and being treated by respect by one's supervisor. Those are all things that the employees of the companies that were voted the best places to work in South Carolina value. All of these statements reflect the ethics of the corporations and their leaders, both their executive teams and their boards. I was fortunate to learn about good values very early in my life. My parents were focused on making sure that my brothers and I developed a strong value system. My father worked for what was then a small construction company when I was a little child, Daniel Construction Company, which later grew into one of the largest construction companies in the world. It later became Floor Daniel and now is Floor. As a child, I was taught about the importance of a strong work ethic and the importance of a strong sense of mission, vision, and values for your company and for your life. Since Daniel was a small company, but a very entrepreneurial company, all of the employees and their families were part of the Daniel family, the team members that made the company successful. The founder was Charlie Daniel, and everyone at the company shared his vision to build a world-class construction company. Even the families of the employees shared that vision. The company was built on hard work, meaning that the people at Daniel worked harder than anybody else around. It was built on respect for one another and for their clients. Loyalty, trust, fairness, and honesty. Daniel Construction Company had a reputation for delivering a job ahead of time and under budget. Often, the only contract was a handshake. 
From the time I was a little girl, I was taught that your word is your bond, your handshake is your contract. Reliability, dependability, and honesty were the core values upon which Daniel was built and were the values my father embraced as he led Daniel to become an international construction company. I also learned that you should show respect to everyone, regardless of whether they were part of the executive team or the person digging the ditches. Everyone is important to the team. That is true in everything you do, whether it is your company, your volunteer job, your sports team, or your class project. Show everyone respect. This will lead to mutual trust. I observe the golden rule in action as I watch my father interact with his employees. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I can't imagine a better foundation for your personal ethics policy or a better guiding philosophy in your life. The golden rule. It was obvious from the list of the drivers of engagement that I just read to you for the employees of South Carolina companies that this is true and so important. As a leader of your organization, of your team, which I hope each of you will have that opportunity to do one day, you have to set the right tone. You have to create a culture of doing the right thing all of the time. As Martin Luther King said, the time is always right to do what is right. I have had some wonderful mentors who have significantly impacted my life and my values. They have helped shape who I am. They have encouraged me to step out of my comfort zone and to take roles and responsibilities for which I did not feel qualified at the time. They had more confidence in me than I had in myself, and their confidence gave me the courage to take bold steps to join some corporate boards and boards of nonprofits and to take on the chairmanship of organizations. Roger Milliken encouraged me to run for the Greenville Spartanburg Airport Commission about 16 years ago when I had very little, if any, experience in that arena. However, he thought I could do the job. He and I had served together on <coughs> the Walford Board of Trustees, and he knew me, and I knew Mr. Milliken. I also knew how hard he worked and how demanding he was of others. Mr. Milliken was one of the two founders of the Greenville Spartanburg Airport, along with Charlie Daniel. Mr. Milliken served as chairman of the airport from the day the airport opened on October 15, 1962, till the day he died almost 48 years later. He was meticulous in everything he did in his life. He shared all of his values and his personal ethics with all of the airport commissioners and with the staff of Greenville Spartanburg Airport, of Greenville Spartanburg airport. and he was determined to make GSP one of the best small airports in the nation, and I think it is, and we still are determined to make sure that is always the case. Mr. Milliken was a tremendous mentor to me personally, and he tried to groom me to be the chairman of the GSP Airport Commission, which I am today. I think about Mr. Milliken's lessons and his expectations for Greenville Spartanburg Airport daily. Another important mentor in my life has been Tommy White. She was a lawyer in Greenville. More importantly, however, Tommy has been responsible for preserving the Mountain Ridge Wilderness in North and South Carolina. Hopefully many of you have taken advantage of hiking in those areas. He founded Natural Land Trust, which has been the catalyst in preserving hundreds of thousands of acres in both states. He is also the person who had the foresight to bring world-class city planners to the city of Greenville back in the early 70s when Greenville was going the way of most cities at that time. Our downtown was dying and all of the stores and the people were moving out to the malls and to the suburbs. Tommy, along with Max Heller, our mayor, my father, Buck Mickle, and others, had the vision to transform downtown Greenville. He also had the vision to accumulate and preserve the land along the Reedy River in Greenville so that it would one day be the focal point of our downtown, which it is today. Both of these visions took persistence and determination and a tremendous amount of patience. They took a long time. They also required other people to share that vision. Both Tommy White and Mr. Milligan were indefatigable in their persistence of their goals, and they gathered their teammates along the way to help them achieve their goals. Tommy White included me in many of his projects. I was particularly fortunate to be part of the River Place Committee that Tommy put together 
to help plan the future of the properties that we have gathered along the Reedy River. Tommy taught me to be persistent and to never give up on goals that were important. Tommy, Mr. Milliken, and my father were highly focused and insisted upon excellence. <coughs> These three individuals were critical in shaping my value system and my personal ethics. I appreciate the lessons that I have learned from my parents, my mentors, and so many others. They make up my sense of ethics, who I am, and how I function in everything I do. I'm also grateful for all of the ethics policies and the conflict of interest statements that I have to sign as a board member or a trustee of these organizations in which I participate. They're helpful in setting the rules and parameters in which you can function. And as we see more and more politicians make mistakes about their own ethics, the written policies become imperative to help keep someone from making unwise decisions and sliding down that slippery slope. One of Governor Haley's main goals this legislative session is to pass an ethics policy. I've learned through the years that your life is connected by dots. For the students here today, you will later realize that so many things you will do later in life will be connected to your days at PC, to your friends now and later in your career. You will also find that your values are connected by dots to your experiences that create your ethical roadmap for your life as they have for mine. The following words from an unknown author will be invaluable as you develop your own ethics policy and your own roadmap for the future. Watch your thoughts because they become words. Watch your words for they become actions. Watch your actions for they become habits. Watch your habits for they become character. Watch your character or it becomes your destiny. I wish all of you a great destiny, and thank you very much for the honor of speaking to you today. Thank you. I would be happy to take any questions if, if anyone has questions for me. I would be happy to try to answer them. Possible, anything about experiences I've had or, or whatever. But if you don't have them, that's fine too. <laughs>
my uh, father's father died at age 12. And so in terms of the way he developed that value system, I'm sure he developed it by emulating my grandfather and also Charlie Daniel, who was actually his uncle. And I think you develop it over time and develop the feeling that you it's important to give back to the community and uh, always try to do the right thing that you can for others. I think it's just sort of growing through.